With fiber optic internet and multi-gig cable internet, it's time to upgrade the PFSense router to a 10 gig connection. I'm using an old chassis that I got from a job site. This model is a Hoffman case. It's very well made and it has a glass, tempered glass front door. I'll remove all of these patch panel components, clean up the case, and here's the model number in case you were wondering. We're using an 8th gen quad core i3. This will work nice at low voltage, but you can use whatever you please. This low profile fan will also fit in the 2U case, along with this mini ATX motherboard. This is great because it works with standard power supplies that are easy to obtain. I'm using just a matching pair of 2400 MHz DDR4, but the most important part, this dual 10 gig base T Intel network adapter. This card specifically works with PFSense and has a low profile bracket included, which will fit nice in our 2U case. SATA or M2 solid state drives will make the PFSense nice and quick. This 2U case is from StarTech and fits perfectly in the rack. This again is specifically chosen because it uses a standard ATX power supply and can fit a standard ATX motherboard. However, the cards need to be half height For your internet service provider's modem, I'm using a StarTech 2U vented shelf, so that way I can secure the modem to the bottom of the rack. This allows for easy access to resetting it if needed. Now that we have our components together, we can begin to build the PFSense in the 2U rack. I recommend that you choose whatever components are in your budget, but also make sure that they meet the requirements of what PFSense has set forth. Making these components affordable and easy to obtain is the key to having a good, strong home or office router. This PF Sense can actually be duplicated for not too much money, so having a spare on hand just is a good peace of mind if you, uh, if you really need that mission-critical setup. Um, as far as the motherboard here, it's using solid capacitors across the board, and uh, you could even purchase a Asus workstation board. About once a year, I always make sure to dust out the CPU fan and any of the other filters or fan components inside the case. This will keep the PFSense running for a quite a long time. I'm only using 8 gigs of memory, but you can certainly use more or you can certainly use less. In this case, the memory is matched and the CPU and all of the components are new, so I will get the longest lifespan out of this PFSense setup. When installing the CPU, just be careful not to damage any of the pins. Also, locate the notch on the corner of the CPU socket and on the corner of the CPU, so that way when you put it in the first time, you don't have any issues. You can use the thermal paste that comes with your CPU cooler, but I have chosen to use an upgraded thermal paste due to the high temperatures here where I live. This will also improve the longevity of having to use the CPU in a high temperature environment. Preventing any obstruction and airflow across the motherboard is key. So in this case, I'm using a zip tie to tie up the CPU fan's power cable and locate it in a manner that it does not create any obstruction more than necessary across the board. Now I'm going to mount the solid state drive to a mounting bracket that fits inside the case. It's time to prepare the case itself, remove the screws, open it up and locate the hardware kit inside. Remove that and while you're inside there, it's time to install the motherboard back panel. This is very important, some people always forget this. Now I'm removing the center hard drive caddy, and that way I can install the solid state drive on its tray adapter in this location. This case has mounting posts already installed, which perfectly match this motherboard, and I did not need to add any additional. So now that I have everything in place, I'm going to secure the motherboard to the actual case. This case came with a free PC buzzer speaker, so that way you can hear when there are post air codes or beeps. Using an existing or older SATA cable, I'm connecting to port 0 on the motherboard for when I install the solid state drive later. Now, 
choose the half height cards, which you will remove the faceplate for, for installing the network interface card or any other cards that you would need. In this case, I just needed to remove one. Place your ATX power supply in the correct location in the corner. And in this case, there is very little cooling. So I'm putting it with the fan up and the vent out back. And there is a small vent to the side. However, this will not draw too much heat due to the nature of the system itself. Secure that solid state drive back into its location now that everything's in place and you have all of the cables out of the way. Begin to start plugging in the solid state drive and begin the cable management process uh, again with keeping in mind low resistance. You do not want air to get trapped between cords that were bundled up and poorly managed. So as you can see, I'm going one at a time, straightening the cables, making sure everything's going to be routed with the best possible place. The ATX power cords are what I'm installing, and they're the bulkiest ones. And at the end, you will clean up most of the cabling, but for now, getting it in its natural place is the first step. Details can be applied at the end to get everything tidied up. Make sure your modern power supply also has the standard Molex connectors so you can pair up these old fans using these standard Molex connectors. Again, routing the cabling is very important to keep them out of the airflow. Most wires are pretty tolerable to tension and pressure, but do not over tighten your zip ties when you do the cable management. I always recommend using flush cutters to give the flat, even cut on any zip tie. Connect the serial ATA power to the solid state drive and route the cabling in a fashion that's going to create a nice, even look. I'm also using a zip tie under this solid state drive to create the cable path and route that just looks aesthetically pleasing, also keeping the airflow uh, above it. In this corner of the case, near the back of the power supply, I'm going to take the bulk of the spare cabling and bundle them together in a fashion that also prevents any sort of movement, but also allows air to pass through. Take your Intel PCI Express 10 gig card and remove the two screws holding the original full-size bracket on, then install the half-height bracket with the same hardware. This allows it to fit in this 2U case. I chose the dual port card because it just fits on the single PCI slot and this motherboard only has one PCI X16 slot, so it works out perfect. As you can tell, the system is looking pretty clean right now and it should be ready for us to turn on and go through the BIOS and then boot the PFSense installer. This is going to be a great appliance for any home office or small business, it's just going to be a robust, easy to replace and repair machine. And as you can tell, I'm using an old CD version at the time of this recording, but you can use a USB installer as well. Configure your BIOS to turn itself on from a power loss. You can even use Wake on LAN, and then make sure your boot settings are set to legacy support and boot from the USB or CD-ROM installer. Once you have the PFSense screen up, Follow the instructions and configure the router exactly how you would like to be done. Installations go quickly with the solid state drive, and so do all the updates. Here is the 10 gig network. As you can see, Windows is showing it's connected at 10 gigs, and the details are on a QNAP Thunderbolt connected SFP Plus adapter. This is running on a razor blade advanced laptop, which supports the Thunderbolt protocol. As you can see down in the device list, that also gives us that bus speed to get the full 10 gig of a SFP Plus transceiver. So let's run a speed test. The dual network adapter is negotiating at 2.5 gig directly off my multi-gig cable modem, which is a Netgear CM2000. And then the LAN is also negotiating to the Netgear 10 gig switch at 10 gigs. Cox is currently pushing one gig to my account, but I'm getting higher speeds due to their new network. 
You can also see this new network reflected by the upload speed. It used to be around 35 to 40, but it has since tripled with their new network speeds. I am still only paying for the one gig plan. I plan on upgrading to Quantum Fiber, which has an eight x eight symmetrical fiber connection to your house for around $160 a month. So soon I will update that video and do that speed test. But for now, one thing I noticed is I had to manually set the negotiation of my WAN connection to 2.5 gig, multi gig, instead of auto negotiation. What speeds are you getting off your PFSense router? Here's just a quick overlook of it. This Hoffman case is mounted directly with tapping bolts to a Harbor Freight dolly, and I still have the keys to keep it secure. Inside, you can see the multiple shelves holding a Hike Vision rebranded network video recorder and the PF Sense up top powering a USB powered light. Next, we have the Netgear XX712T 10 gig switch with full 10 gigs across all ports. Uh, then you have a HDMI 4K splitter for the cameras. And I keep a clock just to see if the battery has ever died uh, due to extended power outages. The CyberPower 1500VA battery backup is a must have. And I'm using the Netgear old Wi-Fi 4 uh, 10 gig X10. That is also going to be replaced soon as soon as I get the quantum fiber. Thanks for watching, and let me know about your setup.